Hello, welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is a program in which I interview people about the legal issues in Vermont. Uh, it just happens that today I interviewed someone in British Columbia about domestic violence. Uh, it was interesting to hear how they handle these, these problems uh, there in a different country. My guest uh, today is Ingrid Jonas, whom I've known for many years. A long time ago, I did something called the Public Defender Show. And I think, uh, Ingrid, you were a guest in that show, weren't you? That, that is correct. <laughs> wow. <laughs> a long time ago. Well, Ingrid, uh, now you've got a different job. What, you, are, uh, you work for the Vermont State Police? Correct. I am a sworn member of the Vermont State Police. I've been, I started out as a trooper, like everybody starts out. Um, that was back in August of 98 that I began my career there. And now you're a major? I'm now at the rank of major. I was promoted to major in uh, uh, September of 2017. Wow. Wow. That's great. Well, it's a lot different. That role is much different than the role um, of being a Good old trooper, regular <laughs> road trooper. All right. Well, you're, uh, what, what is it? You're in charge of support services? Uh, yes. So there's three different major positions in the Vermont State Police. Um, one is running the field force or all of the folks who people commonly think of when they think of a state trooper, people on the road in the marked cars. The other side of the house is the criminal investigative division. So plainclothes detectives who respond to major crimes and other types of crimes that maybe take more time to complete. My side of the house is all of the back end support for those two sections. So recruiting new members, um, in service training, um, internal investigations, of, um, fair and impartial policing, um, all the dispatch centers that we have, the emergency communication centers, um, all of the infrastructure stuff. Wow. Now, was there a time when you were uh, a trooper dealing with domestic violence cases? Yes, that was actually why I joined state police was because I um, had done work, as you know, um, from our, when we knew each other before then, um, doing advocacy work in the community, actually in Burlington, um, working um, with victims, survivors of domestic and sexual violence, and also working with men who were convicted for domestic violence offenses. I then left that work um, to become a trooper in hopes of really um, being the type of trooper that, you know, somebody who had experienced a violent crime would want to talk to about, um, would trust, you know, to speak to about what had happened to them and then hopefully make a difference in that area of domestic and sexual violence. What percentage of the, uh, of the Vermont State Police is female? Uh, we're actually a little bit above the national average for um, police agencies, or at least state police, we are, I think, around 14% women members right now. Um, it's still lo much lower than we'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. But what's the, what's the percentage of women in, in the other branches of law enforcement in Vermont, do you know? I, that's a good question. I think it's between probably 8 and 14%. I think Burlington Police Department might be higher than, than state police. Um, and, but I'm not entirely certain right now. Um, but I would think it probably averages, you know, eight to 10% perhaps in Vermont. And, and well, it just seems to me obvious that there'd be situations in which it would be an advantage to have a woman trooper handling a, a domestic violence case. Was that your experience? You know, I think, I think it did help me. I think what's most important really is, um, you know, in order to solve complex crimes, you have to have those skills of being someone that people want to talk to. So gender aside, that is really what you're going for. You want people to tell you what happened and um, be, trust you enough to do that. So that means, you know, authenticity and good listening skills and um, really making someone feel like 
you care. <laughs> um, so I think first, of, it might not necessarily be a gender thing, but I think um, those are the qualities you need in order to do good police work. Um, I also think that there are things we can't really control. If you are the victim of a crime, you will be talking to an officer who may or may not trigger you or remind you of a perpetrator or that type of a thing that we don't really have control over. So ways that, you know, any way that you can like mitigate that type of thing. So um, I think it did help me. I don't know if it was gender or just like communication skills or what type of thing, but I do think it can be a help. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, did you go to court and testify in some of these cases? Or? Yes, I spent, um, I did spend time in court. I spent about 11 years as a detective doing sexual um, assault investigations and child sexual abuse cases. And of course, you know, there's a lot of overlap, uh, sexual and domestic violence. Yeah. Um, but I did have cases that uh, went to court, both domestic assault and sexual assault cases. I've been troubled by the fact that so many cases aren't even going to trial now because of the, the the plague and the backlogs and all that stuff. Yeah. I think that must be a real problem now. Can you shed any light on that? Well, I, we did notice, and I actually brought some numbers to talk about here. I'm just gonna switch screens from the camera for a second and just look, but we had, um, I had, um, had us run some numbers on domestic violence related responses 20, in 2020 as compared to 2019. Oh. So family disturbances are up. Domestic abuse order violations are also up. Um, and I also noticed, and this somebody brought this to my attention today as I was preparing for this, to, um, she had said you should run the numbers for domestic crimes committed in the presence of a child, because as you know, those are um, those can be, that's an enhancement, right? right? And those numbers were scary high for last year um, during COVID. So it feels to me like COVID is unfortunately kind of like the type of environment where things like abuse of power and domestic violence can really thrive, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers your question, but our numbers were up for those types of cases during last year. And what, 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 what do you know? Do you have the actual numbers? I mean, was it? Yeah, I can give you those. So let me just look at that again. Bear with me here. So in uh, 2019, we responded, and we're just Vermont State Police, so we're one. We're the larger agency, but we're just one of, say, 80 agencies, um, police agencies in Vermont. Vermont State Police members went to 1,180 family disturbances in 2019 and 1,304 family disturbances in 2020. In 2019, we did 94 abuse prevention order violations as compared to 113 abuse prevention order violations in 2020. Um, and there were, and these are not official numbers, but six domestic violence related homicides last year as compared to five domestic violence related homicides in 2019. Again, I think those numbers <clears throat> need to be verified by the Fatality Review Commission, but those are our rough numbers. So higher across the board. And then for um, enhanced, uh, for crimes committed in front of a child, and just bear with me here for a second, um, it looks like in 2019 for Vermont State Police, we had a total of 46 crimes committed, domestic crimes committed in front of a child, whereas in 2020, we had 62. So that's quite wow. a, yeah. Well, wow. I, I just think the effect on the children is just, it's just ghastly. It's just ghastly. 
the little boys get the idea that it's okay to punch mom. I mean, I think it really has an effect in their behavior later on. Well, Absolutely. And just right. living in that type of trauma has um, known effects on people's wellness, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it brings back some sad memories, you know, of children who were victims who then become perpetrators. I've, I've, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that awful. I once had a case where the, the young man was, uh, I, I learned in the pre-sentence investigation that he had been sodomized as a youth. Mm. And then as an adult, he sodomized this woman in a similar fashion, the, the thing that had been done to him. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's ghastly, just mm -hmm. ghastly. Well, um, is there, um, do you have enough resource? Do, do you think that the state police had enough resources? Was there something that could have helped you do the job better? You know, I think that there are now types of tools that we didn't have back then. You know, for example, there's the lethality assessment protocol, which is basically a validated risk assessment tool out of Maryland that is. Um, it requires partnerships with community-based organizations that work for crime victims, but essentially you ask a, a very small number of questions to a victim in a domestic crime. And depending on the way the victim answers, it can then lead to indicators that that person is at greater risk than someone else perhaps. And in those instances, the officer can then make a direct referral that moment to the community-based organization for survivors. Um, and that um, is something that we really want to build partnerships with um, community-based victim organizations so we can do that work. So I think risk assessment tools are, are important. Um, I think that, you know, building capacity so that officers have more time to dedicate to these types of cases is important. I mean, these cases are really potential homicides in the future, right? We've seen such a link in Vermont to that rate, that 50% rate where 50% of Vermont's homicides are domestic violence related homicides. And um, thinking of each one of these cases as you know, I could be preventing a homicide based on how well I investigate and the rapport that I build with this victim and relying on experts to get victim services for this person. Uh, so building in time and um, training for how really to how to view these and that's a leadership um, um, matter for law enforcement agencies. How do you prioritize these types of crimes? Wow. Well, did you you spent 11 years doing this kind of work? Um, well, I spent time on the road doing sort of first responder domestic violence work, and that was quite some time ago. And then, and that, of course, you get an array of all crimes, um, and not even crimes, but just responding to motor vehicle incidents and crashes and right. burglaries and and uh, you know, and there are some domestic or family violence calls within those. But then I was able to um, become a detective for a number of years doing specifically um, sexual assault investigation for adults and children. And that was um, working in a multidisciplinary team environment where you have a prosecutor and detectives and victim advocates and social workers working together um, on these types of in incidents. Did you have enough, did you, did you suffer from any lack of resources in doing this? Were there other things you needed or? Uh, you know, yeah, I think that just this type of work is, um, we need more people dedicated to doing it and we need um, training and support to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I just, I'm just concerned about the, uh, you know, the resource problems that the state has, you know, that uh, yeah. there's not enough money. I, uh, in my brief stint in the legislature, 
where I served one term. I remember getting up once and saying that the uh, that the Trump tax cuts had saved the wealthiest 2% in Vermont approximately $239 million a year. Wow. <laughs> you know? So I suggested that perhaps we could raise the state's progressive income tax and capture some of that money and use it for things like what you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was utter silence on the floor of the house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's hard. It really is hard. I don't know. Um, I don't know where you're going, but I but I think this is I, I just think that the kinds of things you're talking about obviously need resources and they take time and they take training. It's, I read something this week that referred to budgets as moral documents that speak to, um, you know, your agency or your community's value system. So but yeah. I think that's what you're saying. Uh, that, that said it much better than I did. I mean, that, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. It's it's really, uh, yeah, the inequitable distribution of resources. You know, there are children and, and child victims that really need help and yeah. need support to get through this. It's really tough. Well, how many people are on the Vermont State Police? 400? We have 334 sworn members and then um, roughly another 80 to 100 civilian staff members and dispatchers. Oh, okay. And there are how many uh, police officers and, uh, uh, you know, sh sh like sheriffs or municipal police? I think that there's about 1,200 altogether in Vermont from all the different, uh, from local police departments, sheriff's departments, state police, Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, well, if it's the state police are between three and 400, then the other uh, police agencies would be about 800 or so. Is Correct. Right? Sounds right. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's a tough job. It's a tough job. No, really, I just... Uh, you know, I don't know if I ever told you that. I was once the first assistant special prosecutor for Pennsylvania. My job, was, my job was supervising and prosecuting police. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> we had a, there were substantial problems in Philadelphia, especially. And I look back on some of that work, and then I think about my experiences with police in Vermont. And uh, well, Vermont has it really good compared to other places. I remember once talking to two cops in Philadelphia and this one very handsome big black guy told me that he had drawn his gun once in 10 years. And there was another little white cop there who was saying, well, I draw my gun once a week. Huh. I thought, oh, you know, uh, you know. So I, I just think people don't appreciate uh, the, the really good quality of uh, a lot of the people who've gone into law enforcement in Vermont. I think they should be, uh, they were entitled to more respect than they seem to be getting recently. I am uh, concerned about that. You know, to think that someone could see George Floyd get murdered in Minneapolis and then think that all the cops are violent, it just, it's just nonsensical, you know, it's just nonsensical. That's life. That's life. I think there's, I think there's a lot of um, conversations and trust building that needs to happen. Um, there's a lot of work to be done that just any, I mean, there is so much racial inequity in our country and we, you know, I think we really have, have not done that work that we need to do. And it's just anything that you neglect for that long and don't, don't own and address is just not going to go away. Um, so I think that everybody has a role to play in that. Um, well, I've been encouraged by a lot of the, the discussion and public, you know, information being put out about racial injustice. And yeah. I think there are a lot of people just don't, don't want to deal with that. <laughs> but I think we all have a responsibility to acknowledge that. We do, yeah. It's really an important thing. But I just think that, you know, it's uh, one of the things that I was drilled into me as a judge was that every case is unique to its facts and you can't generalize from one case to another you know not all cases are the same right not, not all cops are the same yeah <laughs> not, all, not all defendants are the same you've got to use individual judgments 
And they got to be fair. That's true. I think that I've been encouraged that a lot of people that I've dealt with in Vermont really do believe that and behave that way. But, uh, you know, it's hard. It really yeah. is. Yeah. It's it challenging hard. stuff. Very challenging stuff. Very challenging stuff. Well, what are you going to do when you're no longer a state trooper? Are you going to, you got some, you're going to take the summer off? Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, um, I would look forward once this career comes to its natural conclusion, I would love to get some downtime and kind of brush myself off and figure out what's next. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah, it'd be nice to just have some downtime. I've just been appalled by seeing people who have to retire because they re reach the ripe old age of 55. <laughs> yeah. I, I, what? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I wish I could be 55 again. <laughs> you know? Right. And actually, that is only for state police um, in, in terms of, well, state police and then a few other um, sworn members in state law enforcement. It's a very narrow, it's a narrow group that has that mandatory retirement age. And I, I think, it, I don't know for sure the history of it. I think it's probably been out long since um, <laughs> outdated, but yeah. it just hasn't been addressed. Um, yeah. Because really 55 is not old um, oh. and you could just be getting your skills as a you know a leader or a major or a division commander whatever your role is and then you have to leave at the same time it does enable you to leave when you're still pretty healthy and um you know do something different so it's kind of a mixed blessing in a way well it won't be a blessing for the state of vermont to lose you well, i think thank you. no ingrid you're you know you're you're special you really are special Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming in today. And if, 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 as always happens, after you do one of these conversations, if you think of something you should have said <laughs> or would like to say, mm -hmm. if you've got my number, we'll, uh, we'll do uh, Ingrid Jonas too. Okay. No, that sounds good. I hope, and I know that you have had these, or we spoke before and you have the numbers for community-based uh, victim services organizations, but just yep. making sure that people have um, those numbers if they need. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I've asked that those telephone, those 800 numbers be put on the screen for this when it's broadcasted. Yes. So, I, so and, uh, and I've asked uh, Karen, uh, Karen Transgott-Scott at the Vermont Network to be sure that all her organizations uh, tell people to watch this thing and get that number. Um, I, I, I hope their phones start to ring a little more. Actually, I, I don't think I want them to ring, but I think, right. they should, you know, people need help. If there's a need, yes. Well, it's I think- It's been an honor, thank you. It's so nice to oh. see you, even though it's virtual. Yeah, it's even though it's virtual. It makes me look bald, but I'm not really nothing. You look great. <laughs> you look very healthy. Oh, thank it's you. Nice. Very. Yeah. Well, you look great too, Ingrid. It's great to see you. Nice thank to you. see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you, have any, if you have any thoughts for something else or somebody else I should talk to, or you want to come back with other people, just let me know. We'll try to set it up for I you. I will. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Bye-bye.